All right, Bob, I believe you want to stop. Yeah, as soon as those persons sit down. And if anyone feels he or she has to leave earlier, if you would please sit closer to the door in the rear, especially the open door, we'd appreciate it. And it seems very warm in here, so you might open the other door too, unless, is that too noisy for you? I think we should, don't you find it warm? Do you like water, Lucas? Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest tonight is artist Lucas Samaras, who has made a considerable reputation by his inspired transformations of the commonplace and the banal into art. Samaras is flamboyant, theatrical, obsessive, articulate, and unfailingly original. A very warm welcome to you, Lucas. Thank you very much. You were born in a small village in Macedonia. Not village, town. What is the difference? What is the difference? What is the difference between uh, a city person and a peasant? I know some peasants who live in the city. <laughs> but nonetheless, in this small town in Macedonia called Castoria, a town that was a city, in fact, that was rich in Byzantine architecture, came to this country after spending the war years in Macedonia, came to this country in 1948 and settled in West New York, New Jersey. That was 1948. Within seven years, you had a scholarship to Rutgers University. I have just encapsulated your life in about three sentences, but that is a remarkable leap. How did you manage to do that? How did that all come about? And how influential was that Rutgers experience in terms of your own life and your own work? Well, I don't know. I was lucky. I was lucky that uh, uh, I was able to come here because my father had been here during the war. So he, had, he was able to get the papers and so on. And I was lucky that I had uh, decent teachers who took uh, sort of interest in me. I had a very nice uh, art teacher, for example, Fabian Zacone, who was very good, an English teacher and so on. Um, also, I was lucky that uh, at that time that the government had set up certain scholarships and so on. You know. uh, what else can I tell you? I don't know. Some people are lucky, some are not. But you didn't expect to be an artist when you went to Rutgers, did you? Well, I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought I was going to go into the army or something. Um, I liked art throughout public school and high school and so on. And I thought maybe I would go to college, uh, take art courses, and then become a psychologist or psychiatrist or something. Something dignified, you know. But uh, when I went to college, I took a course in, in psychology, and it was full of statistics, you know. So that killed it for me. Well, not only did you have some interesting teachers, you had some interesting classmates. And while at Rutgers, you became a part of a group that certainly influenced your life. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, well, it was a strange time. Uh, I sometimes go to lecture now at different universities, and uh, you know the departments have 400 art students, 600, 200, and so on. We were about seven, you know, including the art historians, so it really was a dumpy little group. We had a, a nice little uh, boarding house kind of thing. And in the basement, there were two tables, and that was the art school, you know? Uh, so it's sort of, mm, I don't know, it makes me squirm sometimes when I go to these huge places with fantastic equipment, you know? Uh, what did you want to know? Or how Who was it? the other students? How was it? Well, uh, we had uh, two, uh, good teachers, well, they weren't teachers, they were just older, you know, artists, sort of. Yes, they were teachers, but Alan Capra was one, George Siegel was the other. Students, uh, Bob Whitman, who was very instrumental in the development of happenings in the 60s. We have another artist who's uh, making paintings now, Bob Harding. Um, in, I was at Rutgers, and then the female part was at Douglas. And Roy Lichtenstein was there. George Brecht was involved. Wasn't Jim Dine there? Uh, Jim Dine was not there. 
No. But he was later a part of your happiness. He was in Cincinnati or something. Uh, well, he was instrumental in the happenings also, yes. How did the happenings evolve? Did Alan Capro start them? Well, Alan Capro was this brilliant student of Maya Shapiro's. Uh, he was an artist. Um, he uh, was interested, I think he had studied with a K, Cage in uh, New School. Um, so through his art historical researches and so on, he became aware of uh, the avant-garde of the 20s, 10s, and so on. And he was interested in um, making people walk through paintings, sort of, to begin with. Uh, and he did a number of, well, once or twice, I think, he had shows where people trekked through the gallery and he had raffia and so on, so that as they were walking, these uh, things would brush against them and so on. See? And the next step was, of course, to bring in people and to perform, have a performance. So he did a nice performance called uh, 18 Happenings in Six Parts or something like that, 1959. And that was like the formal beginning. Now meanwhile, Red Grooms was also doing some kind of a theatrical event in a small dumpy little place downtown in the Lancy Street or around there somewhere. Why um, was this para-theater considered art? Why was it art? Because artists were making it. Why weren't they actors? The actors weren't smart enough. <laughs> Please continue to describe what went on during that period. And you wended your way with that group, the Happenings Group, to New York? Well, uh, I was lucky again, because as soon as I graduated from Rutgers, Alan Capra knew this young woman who wanted to start a gallery called the Rubin Gallery, because she had a sister who was a painter, and she wanted you know, her sister to have access to a gallery. Anyway, it was a terrific gallery. Um, so I showed there. And the second year, that gallery became a happenings gallery. It sort of folded, having shows once a month and so on, and it became just happenings. Uh, how did it become happenings? I don't know. It was what role did you play in the happenings? Well, um, I appeared in Alan Capro's because I liked him, a friend, and so on. He said, why don't you do this? And I did that. Um, I appeared, I guess, as an immigrant in lots of them. Not actually calling myself an immigrant, but uh, they used my accents or my theatricality, you know. Um, Bob Whitman was a friend of mine, so I appeared in lots of his later in uh, Oldenburg's and so on. What did you ask? How did it evolve and what role How did you play it evolve? in the happening? Well, that's like saying, it's too difficult a question, so I'm um, just giving you little snippets. Let's try for another snippet. You are known for your celebrations of the self. In fact, a, an almost relentless self-involvement. Someone described your work once as the drama of self-encounter. So perhaps you ended up as a psychiatrist and an artist. Why does so much of your work deal with yourself? To what extent is your personality the subject of your work? Well, because I was a foreigner, uh, I had to watch myself a little bit more than the rest of you. Now, you know, why did I have to watch myself? I came here in 1948. The climate was much different. I don't know how it would be now for a young person, but then it, would be it was different. It was after the war. There were flags flying, daughters of the American Revolution. McCarthy was just around the corner. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, this incredible thing that you heard about. I mean, in Europe, what do you know about the Ku Klux Klan? But here you come in and you see a picture of hooded people, lynchings and whatnot. I'm not saying that they happened then, but uh, it was still active. So it was uh, a fearsome place, you know. If I didn't do the right thing, I may wind up in jail or something. I had to watch it, although I was 11 and a half. Um, so um, that self-involvement, you know, was always with me somehow. So then it was just a matter of professionalizing it, see. Um, 
somehow I want to take something that other people would consider an insult, turn it around, and make it into a virtue. And is that insult? Now, if somebody told you, oh, what a narcissistic little blonde woman you are, you know. Well, you take that, you turn it into a weapon, you see. And, um, but you That's think that the do. word that has negative connotations is narcissism. Well, it had, it had negative connotations before I started. And what do you now think you have done self, to it? What I, well, I liberated it, I think. And how have you accomplished that? How? Well, how did I do it? It's exposure, I think. Uh, exposing, um, again, parts of myself either the visual art parts or else the psychological parts, uh, exposing them through some kind of artifice or control or a device like art so that it was okay then. It was just not a question of just my going the street and saying, look at me, blah, blah, ripping off the clothes and so on. It was done in a professional way. Now naturally when you do something that is a little different than what was done before, the other professionals, you know, object to it. You know, so naturally there's squealing and hollering and so on, but if it's done professionally, eventually you, you get things done. But there is still an obsession with self-referential imagery. Uh, for me or for others? I think for you and perhaps for some others as well, but we're talking about you yes. of the moment. Well, um, You have to try to do what you're good at. You know? Some people are very good at being teachers. Some people are very good being social sort of people, mothers, fathers, and so on. They go out and they make other people happy. They give them things and so on. Uh, I'm not very good at that. You know? Whereas I am good at investigating myself and then uh, creating that as some kind of um, um, some kind of what? Uh, some picture, some, some device, something that other people can take from, what do you call that? It's a... Catalog, a frame of reference? Well, all that, yes. Well, the idea of vanity and exhibition... Example, yes. Uh, vanity and exhibitionism abounds in your work. But and early on, your own self-exposure and self-revelation and self-examination was thought of as sensational. What has occurred in the most recent period is that the feminist movement, the video movement, and the body art movement has not only placed your work in a pioneering stance, in a sense it has diluted its shock value. Well, it Does happens. that intrude on the nature of your work? Uh, well, let me think. There is such a thing as a time, you know, a time at which you do something. And then 10 years later, it's not the same thing, it's not the same time. Uh, so some of my work, I mean, the time that has gone since I've done something, has made me sort of turn into a grandfather, you know. I kind of like that, and then other times I kind of hate it. Um, but when you are dealing with taboos, taboos, you, um, you have to face that once you break a taboo, then either you're going to find some others or else there will be none for a while. Well, in breaking that taboo with your relentless self-investigation, and certainly it was a pioneering stance, there is an aspect of it currently that uh, almost is Puritan in its denial and almost conventional in its nostalgia. Did you ever consider those possibilities? Well, I consider everything, you know. Uh, and sometimes I can turn the convention into a taboo and then work with it. Are you currently working well, with that same well, self Well, now, for example, uh, I'm asking people, friends, acquaintances, sometimes somebody I may meet only once, uh, and certainly I've asked you, but you refused, to come to my studio 
and take off their clothes and I can take a picture of them with me. So I have a setup like this here where I have a chair and I have another chair. And in this chair I sit all the time and this is where my guests sit. Only they have to take their clothes off. Um, I think you may be one of the few that have refused. <laughs> what, what a distinction. I actually found it too conventional. <laughs> I think once you do it, you will uh, change your mind. You are going to do it next week, right? <laughs> no, but this is very interesting for me because after having spent so many years, you know, exposing myself, all parts of me, you know, are open to the public. Yes, we know every part of you. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've invited other people, it's fascinating to me that there are other people. Other people exist and so on. And they are of different Because your ages. Polaroids have always been <clears throat> auto. And now you are directing that same attention to the investigation of other bodies mm. and selves. Yes. Is there any recurring theme? Uh, what do you mean by a recurring theme? Well, I think that uh, your work reveals that you investigate not only the superficial and the manifest, but the interior and the intrinsic. Now that you have, in a sense, exposed many bodies, you have obviously exposed many psyches as well. What is the cumulative effect of this in investigation? I don't Both know pictorially yet. and psychologically. Well, I'm in the midst of it, so I'm not, uh, you know, very clear about what it means and so on. All I'm interested in is that I have photographed people from the age of 75 to about nine. Um, and it's fascinating to me that, um, well, I think I'm interested in the result. I'm interested in the photograph. The session itself like goes by and I don't know what the hell happens. You know? It's like I'm in a state of uh, suspension or something. Uh, because I'm embarrassed, you know, there's some person there nude for the first time. Um, sometimes it's pleasing, sometimes it's unpleasing, you know, sometimes you know, there's a scar here or a pimple or whatever one. Whereas in an erotic situation, you know, there's subdued lights, you know, kissy kissy and all that, so it's much different. You know, this is like a doctor saying, don't worry dear, you know, you look terrific, even though, you know, you may not. Uh, meanwhile, while I'm doing my photographs, I'm thinking, gee, I hope this comes out right, because this person is going to say, what a lousy picture you're taking, after I've spent days coaxing them to come and, you know, the right occasion. <laughs> but after it's all done, you know, I don't care what troubles, you know, I have, I'm left with this wonderful, you know, human abstraction. I think perhaps you might like to explain why you call it an abstraction. Because you've not only transformed that body into a photograph, but within that medium you've made yet another transformation. Can you explain and describe what you do? Well, the, the person turns into an abstraction, like, you know, this is, a, this is an object, it's not a human being, it's an object. Well, the human being also turns into an object, uh, where if you look at the photograph, you begin to say, well, look at that leg, how it's shaped, or the color that I've used, or the foot. It, you begin to suspend the communication of person to person. You begin to look at the fact, you know, the flesh, the skin. Uh, and then you have other connections with the past. Now, this person may remind you of something. This shape may remind you of something, and so on. So it's an abstraction, form and color and all that stuff. You use a particular kind of camera. Several years ago, you received a gift from a camera manufacturer and discovered a new medium. Tell us something about the medium and its multiplicities for you. The Polaroid you're talking about. Um, well, the nice thing about the Polaroid is that you have a picture within moments. You don't have to send it to be processed, or you don't have to spend a couple of hours working in the laboratory. It's there, and I like that very much. Uh, now they have 8 by 10, so it's a larger format thing. They even have a bigger one, 20 by 24 or something. Um, there's something that you do to disrupt that surface. Oh, you're talking about the manipulation of oh, yes. the SX-70s, yes. I see. My new, my new photographs don't have any manipulation, yes. they're straight. You know? 
We're the going Ottoman. back to one, oh, I see, the one step backwards. Well, the early It was photograph. certainly pushing the medium a step forward, and I think that it'd be interesting for you to describe what you did with it. You used the SX-70 with that, didn't you? Yes, Where you manipulated yes. the... Well, I don't know if it's pushing the medium forward. You know, I don't know what it means, but uh, okay. You take the SX-70, and it's a sandwich of many chemicals, like 16 layers of chemicals. So there's a clear plastic on top, 16 layers of chemicals in the middle, and a black mylar on the bottom. So if you put it on a hard surface and you press upon it, you disturb those 16 layers of chemicals upon which the uh, shape, the figure, and so on, is uh, created. You take a picture and there's a face there. Well, that face is formed in 16 layers of chemicals. By pressing upon it, you disturb the emulsion. So by pushing it a little bit, I can give you a bigger nose than you have, you know. By, by compressing it, I can make your face skinnier, skinnier and so on. Essentially, that it is. It's a stupid thing. But you have to do it with some finesse. Otherwise, if you press too hard, you get to the bottom, which is the black. So you get the kind of muddy sort of situation. So it has to be very light touch. You have to be intelligent enough to set up a right situation. So with a little touching, it will come out right. And the other thing is that you have to use uh, uh, bright colors when you're photographing. Like here, in this situation, you have that kind of light and that kind of light, and that's it. Well, I have to use the reds and greens and so on. So that when I start pushing the Polaroid around, some color is lost, but still you have a great deal of intensity. Because if you took a Polaroid now, it would be kind of bland, whitish, and so on. Now, sometimes I like that, but in general, most of the time I use you know, lots of lights, colored lights. You said you have to set up the right situation. Well, you've set up a situation where your world and your apartment is your own private and in some ways secret domain. You've said it's where you eat and where you sleep and where you think. And someone described a very tiny area in your apartment, your kitchen, where you work a great deal as an Aladdin's cave. How would you describe this environment in which you spend so much of your time? Because you obviously enjoy your solitude as well and have created, a, in a sense, an all-purpose environment for yourself. Well, uh, I think it, um, it started because I, um, I come from a poor background, let's say middle lower. <laughs> so for many years, uh, I, I had to work in my bedroom. You know, we had a small apartment. My sister slept in the living room. My parents had their own room, and I have had a whole small little room. So uh, for many years, I made art in that, my little bedroom. You know, so it was stocked full of works and so on, but the bed. What were you making then? I was um, up to around 1964, so I was making pin things and feather, plaster, whatever, pastels, lots of different kinds of things. Uh, that was in West New York, New Jersey. Now, when I moved to New York after college and so on, I lived in a dumpy little place on 77th Street, East 77th Street. Again, it didn't matter what it looked like, but it was mine, it was compact and so on. And like the first day, I remember, Going there, I was hoping that this apartment would be lucky for me, you know? So I sat down and drew something, and I drew some nice things that later turned into an artwork. Well, the same thing happened when I moved across the park on the west side. Again, I, I didn't care what it was, I just wanted it to be lucky for me. I wanted it to be magical, sort of, that this would be the space where I would do something that would be good, and so on. You believe in these mysterious icons? Well, how can you not? Yeah. <laughs> I come from, you know, a lot of disasters and so on, and I'm still here, so you have to believe that. So, the kitchen, I have a small, tiny little kitchen, but it's compact, and it's, uh, I have a nice degree of pressure, you know, not too much, not too little. And when the time came to photograph myself with a Polaroid, that was ideal, because it contained yeah, the stove and the table and the refrigerator and so on, basic ingredients, you know. You've created a world on that table. Well, it's, yeah, it's... 
Well, I, I know some people, you know, they have a studio, they have to take a car and go to the studio, you know. But I sit down and on my table I can work and I can go like that and turn on the faucet and have a cup of, you know, whatever. I can go, you see everything is within, it's almost as if it's a spaceship or some kind of a submarine, you know. So I like that and I wanted to uh, reveal or to have that as, a, as, as the uh, subject matter for the photography, part of the subject matter this creature inside this space, me. There are many people, as I assume many tonight as well, I can recall you're coming here once before and someone saying at the end of the evening to you, I feel as if I've made a new friend, who are continually surprised by your generosity and your warmth. Continually surprised, particularly because of your earlier works. Art that so often dealt in danger. And I'm talking about lethal knives, bent forks, and razor blades, and pins, and all sorts of menacing devices. Why did your art, the art you produce, look like that then, and is that a theme that still absorbs you? Um, well, I had a dream about a week ago, um, and It was somebody, uh, uh, it was a relative of mine. And what I was doing, strangely, um, his face was you know, sort of in front of me, and I had a knife. And I was cutting off certain parts because they were too loose or something, see? You know, I was cutting a little of the chin off and a little of the thing. And the blood wasn't coming out, you know, it was all right. He didn't seem pained or anything. And sort of, I finished this chiseling part, and then he went and he took a shower, you know. Then I woke up and I said, wow, what a fantastic dream, God, you know. I hadn't done this before in my dream. Uh, so, then You've the next question. You've done it in your art, because in fact the title of one of your shows was Reconstructions. Okay, now, so, um, I must have gotten up in the middle of the night, I don't know, maybe the next morning. I sit down and say, okay now, what do I do? Maybe I'll start writing about it, you know. I, I did put it down, I think, on a, on a little notebook. And then the question is, let me analyze it, you know, what the hell does it mean? Um, and I remember that I had two victims, I mean two models the night before, and I was telling them, well, you know, lift up your chest a little bit because I didn't want the folds. So I was, in a sense, restructuring them, you know, without yeah. doing anything. And it worked very well, but I must have used some of that in the dream. But then I decided I don't want to analyze it. I mean, I like the idea that I had this dream and I remember the image. Let's leave it at that. So, by getting back to your question concerning, you know, sharp things, knives, and so on. I ruined your beautiful little, um, dumb little, uh, but you created something new. Lip. No. You transformed it. No, not quite. But you will. I just unbent it, that's all. <laughs> Let's get back why your art was so but lethal. But I touched it. I did touch it. I didn't transform, but I touched it. Oh, now, um, so that uh, I may give you some answers about why sharp things and so on, but essentially I don't know very much about it. Now, if you ask me, you know, you ask me again, why sharp things, why pins, why? <laughs> Don't you think people have to attack other people one way or another, whether it's with words or actual physical attack or power or something? Don't you think there's, don't you think there's a biological need for you to attack either me or somebody else? No, I don't. Don't you go around the street and say, how dare you, you know, or whatever? Yes, you do. Look at you. Look at the way you're looking at me. <laughs> okay, same, same with me. See, I want to attack. <laughs> but I don't want to go and physically attack people. Well, I can attack a chair or a cup or something. And then I get pleasure out of doing it. But at the same time, I can create something new. And then I let it go. I let other people see it. But I have this need to, to confront objects or people or desires or just what the hell it is. By sometimes not confronting them. 
As I recall, uh, you studied early on with Stella Adler. Hmm. And your theatrical training obviously has in some way influenced your artistic fancies. Hmm. I wonder if you would tell us how studied those exercises are and how important they are to your work. How studied which exercises? You mean my going to the theater school and no, all that? I mean currently, because there is a great theatricality to your work and to your persona that is both engaging and uh, interesting, phenomenal. Hmm. Well, again, it has to do with being aware of what you're doing. You know? um, how can I put it another way? Some people who are actors and actresses, when they walk down, you know that they are actors and actresses. Other people who have power of some kind, they walk and they are like actors, although they may not know anything about you know, what acting is. Um, so I think what was interesting about Stella Adler is you learn there to be a star, you know, to be special. Everything you do is affected in some way. You know? Well, I didn't have to do too much because I was already affected, already a foreigner. You know? I didn't want to be like everybody else. But you never I were. didn't want to be like, you know, average Joe, you know. Hey, how are you? You know, how's the wine? You know, how's the kid? I didn't want that, you know. Why didn't I want it? Uh, that's a good question. Ask me another one. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you reply to that one? Um, you once thought of being an art historian. You studied with Meyer Shapiro after Rutgers. Why did you decide to be an artist rather than an art historian? Because I was not very good, and I think it's important to not do things that you're not very good at. You know, life is, you know, long. You have to do what you can do very well. If you can't do something, you know, let somebody else do it. You know, women sometimes have the problem of, you know, wanting to do too many things. Why did I say that? Because somebody was telling me that recently. But they shouldn't. They should do one thing and do it fantastically, better than anybody else. Do men ever have that problem? Do men have a problem? Usually they don't. Usually. <laughs> Do they? You've said, that, <laughs> you've said that women have been a great source of information to you. Well, yes, of course, I grew up with women. But to this day, it is something that interests you as a source of information. Well, people interest me, not women. I mean, people, you know. A person, you know, more than a dog or a cat or a talking person, you know. <laughs> I made reference before to an earlier work of yours, an earlier show that was called Reconstructions. In the catalog to that exhibition, you were asked a question. I'd like to repeat that question now. The question was, what do you value in art? Uh, what was the question that Barbara Rose asked me? What do I value in art? Well, strangely, I value a lot of things. I value even things that are not art. Uh, I value folk things. You know, I can go down the street and see uh, just uh, images or whatever. It could be junk, it could be whatever. Um, I tend not to value uh, sort of academic things like, you know, this, this color scheme and so on. You know, fancy little places, semi-fancy mm -hmm. places I don't seem to get much out of. But uh, extreme situations, I get things out of. Um, so what do I value in art? I think I like to know that the person who did it um, was kind in the process of making it. I don't care, I mean, if he was evil sort of in other ways, but in making art, I want to know that that person was that making art for him or for her was this, this, um, well, this kind gesture. You know? Does it make any sense? Yes, of course. I might remind you of your answer then, because perhaps you would like to extend it. The reply to the question, what do you value in art? And your reply was unpredictability. Well, that was for me. I want to be unpredictable. Mm. Do you still yeah. hold to that stance? Mm -hmm. You just made reference to the fact that some people, some women, 
do too many things, they should do one thing and do it well. One of the things for which you are celebrated is the diversity of your work. Well, I can That do you work in so many different well, styles. I can do a lot of things well. That's different. <laughs> Why is that different? Why is it different? It has to do with doing them well. Now, if a woman happens to do a lot of things well, fine, terrific, do it. Your work transforms actually every aspect of human life. And your work aims to demonstrate that. Almost everything that you have done in some way is a transformation or a reconstruction. If it is in any dimension, and I'm thinking of the work of last year that viewed abstract art, abstract expressionism in a whole new way. You discovered a new material that was literally material, fabric. How did that work evolve and would you describe those massive eight foot, nine foot canvases that had stitched fabric on them? Is it possible to describe the work without seeing it and how you came to that to the use of and choice of that kind of material? Uh, when I was uh, becoming an artist, you know, in college and so on, um, I saw certain areas to go into. You know. One had to do with the figure, right? Finding some way of making an artwork that involved figures, people, not dogs, although I did paint a dog once, doing something nasty with a woman. Uh, all right, that's one thing. Another thing was what to do with color what to do with um, lines or dots, mm -hmm. what to do with um, what Mondrian did, what Malevich did, what Picasso did. Uh, there are certain people that are there as the adults. And you come in and you say, well, I think I want to do one of those, you know. So I did. You know, I did do a Matisse, you know, I did a Van Gogh, you know, I did, I did a Mondrian and so on. But uh, while you're doing it, you know that you can't get away with it, you know. Your job is not to do in the style of, your job is to find out what they were involved with and then see how you can use that information, draw out some information from yourself, and then invent something. Okay, so, uh, this work that you call the reconstructions, the big uh, constructions are fabric. Uh, I did a lot of my groundwork, you know by work that I did with pastels. I mean, for the previous decade, I had done pastels, I had done um, wall pieces and so on that had to do with that kind of structuring that was other than having a figure and so on. All right, that's one part. The other part was uh, something personal. Now, I happen to come, I happen to make a lot of work out of things that are in the house or in the apartment. You know, if I see a chair, that becomes a subject, and then I say, well, let me think what I can do about it. If I see a cup, okay, that's the cup. If I see a carpet, you know, then I say, well, what can I do with a carpet? Because the carpet exists. I've seen magnificent carpets. Then how, what am I going to do? Uh, there are bed sheets or bed spreads, you know. Uh, and let's see, I had bought materials because I was photographing myself against those materials. And naturally, I like to find many different uses for things, or for people even. You know? uh, I was talking to somebody who came to visit me yesterday from Polaroid, actually. And I was saying, listen, you know, you're sitting here, I'm talking to you, but I'm thinking, how can I use you? Uh, because he is from Polaroid. I want him to give me film because film, Polaroid film, large one, is very expensive. I also want to photograph him. And, if possible, I want to see, you know, what he's thinking, what kind of mind he has. Maybe he can give me some ideas. I want to use people, you know, and then they can use me. I don't want them to just be dead, you know. How are, how are you? How's the weather? How are the kitties? You know, it's got to be active. Well, the same thing with these substances around me, in the house and so on. So. I wanted to do something with fabric because I had already used it. I wanted to use it again. And I made something that I spread on the floor that was monograms of my family, members of the family, four people. 
my sister, myself, my mother, my father, just the initials. It was interesting. It had occurred like a year after my mother died. It seemed, you know, um, it's touchy to bring upon uh, personal information because often a lot of horrible art is done, you know, with good intentions. Uh, nevertheless, I can't avoid it because, you know, it's part of it. So I wanted, while I was making fabrics and so on, making these initials, I sort of then realized that it was a little bit too simple, so I had to create other kind of structures that eliminated the initials. But the initials were there in my mind. They were, I was chopping them up. I was making this goulash, you know, out of the thing. But also, I was making what seemed to me like a shroud. You know, I was saying, gee, I didn't see my mother. You know, she was dead and so on. I, I could wrap her in one of these, and it would be a nice gesture that the son makes to the mother. You know what I mean? So that gave me a kind of a hu um, humane, um, a familial sort of instinct to continue, to, to pursue this, you know. Then it was a question of clicking your mind and saying to your mind, okay, now you better come up with something good because this, you know, you're going to wrap your mother with it. You're not going to, you know, show it to some fancy dumbbell or something. You know what I mean? It's a serious event. Okay. So. Uh, having that sort of in mind, plus the fact that fabric was a cheap little thing. Now we have had fantastic creations by the uh, quilt people, you know, 19th century and so on. Fantastic. Museum, museum, Whitney Museum had a nice exhibition. Nevertheless, it was still mm, the, pro the uh, area of uh, chachkas, you know. So it was another taboo area was an area that was loaded and so on. So I felt, that's it. Let me do something. It was fashion and chic. Yes. It was a remarkable thing that you accomplished. But I wonder if you'd go back to that earlier question. Why do you work in so many styles? And where do your ideas come from, Lucas? Uh, well, I work in many styles because I'm greedy. After I do something nice with some one thing, then I want to stop it and I want to do something else. It's not even a question of wanting to stop it. I can't do anymore. I'm bored. You know, I'm repulsed. I feel like I'm making money then when I do more. You know what I mean? You know what I mean about making money? Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make money, you know. I want to make glory, but not money. What do you do in a dealer? and not necessarily your dealer, because I don't think he would do that, it says, this year it's paintings. Make paintings. No, no a, a dealer, a distinguished, well, no. no You're some quoted do as say having that. said that. Some, some, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you do? You just change galleries. <laughs> but does that happen? Yes, sometimes it does. What are you making this year? I'm making photographs. You're going to pose next week, right? <laughs> I might have to. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make you look good. <laughs> I heard what you did to the other fellow. I'm going to sit up now myself. <laughs> How important is the work of critics? Oh, very important. Work? Very important. Does it affect what yes. you do? It means there's another person out there who says, hmm, it's interesting blah, blah. It's a person talking to you about your work. And uh, or about the idea of art, you know. But you don't know often or always accept those judgments. No, but it's very good. I mean, it's... Because it's, it's at last a dialogue. There is a response a dialogue, to what yes. you've created. There's a human being there talking to you about this abstraction, this wonderful thing that we're devoting our lives to. It's kind of interesting for you to say that, since you really have made a fetish of solitude. Well, critics are, I mean, uh, that's a touchy thing, because critics are people, and then I kind of have difficulties with people, you know. So it comes into that. The abstraction, the critic, that's wonderful, but the actual real person, you know, it's a real person there, you know. Ew, you, know. you know what I mean? No, but I have an idea. Um, <laughs> why don't you talk about your work some more? How did it evolve? 
I mean, you started with happenings, you've worked in boxes, you've worked, in fact, I can recall soon after the time, in fact, of your mother's death that you mentioned, you created a special sort of sugar spun looking mm -hmm. objects mm. that I assume have their roots in your own ancestry to commemorate, if one uses such a reference, uh, the occasion, using the word. The word is very important to your work and by the judgment of several distinguished critics, including Grace Glick, who knows and understands you and your work quite well, she has said you are one of her two favorite artist writers. Do you write a great deal? Is the word important to you? Yeah, the word is important, yeah. Do you incorporate the word often into your work? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some examples of that? Well, I write stories and so on, or um, sometimes I write on my work. What else can I tell you about it? Sometimes, uh, well, I don't know, you know, when you are an art student, you go to, um, um, you go to museums or you, in class, you find out what art has been. And art has been about images, it had also been about words, you know. Once, when, when does the word start? I don't know. Um, but distinguished, no, what can I say? Fantastic things have been done with words as well as with images. So uh, to me, it's fascinating, it's important, it's real. The only thing is to find out the right word. Like in the 60s, early 60s, it was nice to find the word, you know, love or, um, or I am or I don't know, whatever, those things. But now it's kind of boring now, you know, everybody can say love or art. It's difficult to find simple words, you know. Like the, been corrupted. in religion you have God or Allah, something. It was nice at that time, but now what can you do? How can you find some, some meaningful word or sentence even? It's very hard. It's been said that you've always made a shrewd use of clinical psychology in your own work. Is that an assessment with which you would agree both as a, an artist and as a writer? Well, I wouldn't praise my, myself as a psychologist, um, but mm, I was interested in psychology. I was interested in, in some of the concepts involved and so on, and I did have a friend who was a psychiatrist, and we had lots of conversations with him and his wife and so on, a painter. So it interests me. You see, uh, how can I say, I'm not, I'm not an academic. I, I don't remember things. I read, it goes into my head, and then eventually comes out one way or another, but I can't tell you specifics. I just know that I'm affected by it. Uh, same thing with artworks. Uh, or you asked before, how does my work evolve? I don't know, it just happens. I seem to look at the right places, and then um, I do a lot of pushing, you know, I get up a lot of times, uh, I spend weeks or months sometimes, I don't know what to do, I pace my floors and I have arguments with people because things are not happening, but eventually something happens and I go with it. Uh, in the beginning it's crude, it gets a little better, then I have a flowering of this event. Uh, then it seems like I've done just the right amount and you know, I go on to something else. How do you know when a no. work is completed? <clears throat> well, you invite your friends, and they, they make a comment or two. You gauge, you know. They come, they go, you kind of remember what they said. You say, let me see, is that true? You say, gee, maybe it's not. You invite another friend, you know, another point of view. Do you find view. one who agrees with you? Yes, but then if they agree too quickly, then you kind of don't like that either. It's tough, you know, you have to be very careful. As you're developing into an artist, you also have to develop as a critic. You know, you can't depend on somebody else criticizing you. You have to do it. So criticism is important, very important. To the works of what other artists do you most respond? Well, at the moment it's kind of dead, so, you know, there's nothing much to respond. Usually I respond out of jealousy, you know, if I think that somebody else is doing something better than me. And when did you last have that pang? Uh, don't ask me. <laughs> but it happens. Well, you say that nothing is happening. 
there are those who think that would describe the current art scene, would characterize it as there being no dominant school of art at this time, that it is characterized by diversity and multiplicity. There are those who seem to be concerned about it, and others see it as a time of greater ferment than ever before. How do you evaluate it? Well, I'm hoping that it's very good. I'm hoping it's like the late 50s where nothing was happening. A lot of imitations, a lot of uh, garbage. But it was the time when this new movement. So I, I'm hoping for the 80s, 81, 80, 81, something will happen. And what do you expect that to be? I, no, I wouldn't dare, you know. It's none of my business. It's none of anybody's business. Let it happen, you know. Don't push. It has to come by itself, you know. It's not how you described how you created your own work, then. I don't know what I'm going to do next year. I mean, I know what I'm going to do next week. I'm going to photograph you, but I don't know what, <laughs> what I'm going to do next year. <laughs> That's ridiculous. What is your most prized possession, Lucas? You're surrounded by examples, wonderful examples of your work. Uh, quite an array of memorabilia. Mm. It is an environment that you've created. Among those things, or not among those things, what is your most prized so, possession? I think the work that I'm just doing seems to be the most important for me. You know, as I'm doing a new body of work, I get this fear that my house is going to burn down, somebody's going to come and rob it, you know, water is going to come on the top, it's going to be destroyed. And then once I show it, then it sort of relaxes my tension. So that's always the case, no matter what you're that's working on. That's always right. Even if I do a piece of garbage, you know, that I later find out is a piece of garbage. Do you plan to show that work? Yes, of course. Time? No, but anytime soon. Yes, in the fall. The fall of 1979 at the Pace Gallery. Well, yes, I think so. Yeah. How do you see the state? We've talked about the state of the art world. Has the state of the art market affected the state of the art world, do you think? The art market, I don't know very much about it. Uh, has the state of the art market affected the art world? Probably, but it, it always was the case. Even in the 50s, when you had maybe only 10 buyers, uh, still you had you know, some people who were making things just for the buyers, kind of. And now you have, of course, a lot more artists, a lot more people buying and so on. I've been asking a question of lots of artists that came here that isn't really a very fair question, but I think I'll ask it anyway. And that is, um, regardless of price or availability, if you could choose any objects, what would they be? What do you mean, any objects? That you could choose because they're so interested. From the outside? Yes. Mm -hmm. Any works of art, any objects, painting, sculpture? Uh, I don't. Um, Antiquity. You see, I buy things, but in order to use them, in order to photograph them or something, I really don't want to have anything for itself. I don't want the responsibility of preserving it and all that. You know? um, I doubt that I would get anything. The role of the museum in recent times has changed considerably, too. You've also had, uh, already, partial retrospectives of your work in various places. Do you see the role of museums as changing considerably? Do you see them as educational institutions? Do you see them so beleaguered by financial crises well, that their focus and direction will change? Is the museum still so important? Well, for me, the more, uh, the older I get, the more um, unesthetic they become, the more banal they turn. I mean, when I was younger, because you I know so much more, and you've done so much more, Maybe. and seen so much more. Maybe. And emerging sensibilities less are often directional. They seem to me sort of less magical. But maybe it was youth, you know, when I was there, little jerk or something, you know, it was wonderful. But now, I don't know, it's kind of seedy and. Uh, they don't, they don't seem to be um, grand, uh, you know, people with grand concepts, sort of. Is there anything in life that you see surrounding you that has the same great crescendo, that same grandeur around you? 
you obviously long for, and I guess many of us do? No, sometimes uh, I think um, you think maybe in politics, in certain parts of the world, there's something that may turn out to be kind of mysterious or different at least, like in China or Iran, you know, something may happen. You kind of tremble a little bit at the magic of it, you know. Um, other than that. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? No, I didn't. What were your expectations? I mean, you're a very young man and a lot has happened to you. Well, naturally, any child, you know, has fantastic sort of dreams, you know, they want to end up being, well, a Greek child. I wanted to be a prince, see, a filthy rich prince. You may end up that way. Well, I'll be filthy, <laughs> I'll be rich, <laughs> I'll be an artist, not a prince. Um, I think so far it's very good because it's clean, you know. I think it's relatively clean and that's good. What do you mean it's relatively clean? It's clean, you know, I feel kind of clean. I don't feel dirty, you know, I haven't done, I don't think, things that, that a prince would have to do, you know what I mean? So I feel, okay, my only problem is what to do about tomorrow. I am in the midst of middle age, you know, I have to face that, uh, that catastrophe, you know. I have to see the people around me, you know, and then I have to say, well, what am I going to do? To whom am I going to talk to? And what am I going to do? That's the question. What am I going to do? Well, whatever it is, we know it will be of considerable interest. Thank you very much, Lucas Maris, a remarkable art artist, to talk with us in such a consequential fashion. Thank and you. Thank you for being with us, too. What we do is ask the class to join in the interviewing process. If you have a question, won't you raise your hand and I will call on you. And if you care to, please identify yourself by name. Does anyone have a question?